A difficult day recently for one Detroit pastor detained by Detroit police outside his own church. Pastor Lorenzo Sewell believes a man drilled into the lock of an entrance and then got inside what's being called a church jacking. Mm. Fox News' Brandon Hudson explains. There I am. He's trying to stop me from going into the building. He's asking me who I am. I tell him my name's on the building. Pastor Lorenzo Sewell walks us through one of the most difficult days of his life. Surveillance video shows Detroit police detain him outside 180 Church, where he served as pastor for nearly five years. Look, walking me off in handcuffs. What was that feeling? <laughs> Violation. Not, not, not for me, but for people that look like me that don't have Todd, Todd Perkins as their attorney. People that look like me that don't have relationships. Pastor Sewell says on June 7th, the man drilled into the lock of an entrance. Detroit police were in the parking lot as the pastor showed up, but officers denied him entry. Sewell tells Fox 2 he believes a group previously associated with the church took over its building, bank account, and business entities. Sewell calls it a church jacking. Why do you think they were targeting you and targeting 180 Church? It's just the power of privilege. I believe that when you are white and you have power, you feel like, I own this, instead of saying, wow, this guy's been the pastor for five years. With the help of his attorney, Sewell got his church back. He's filed a police report and a complaint with his bank. The pastor says the bigger issue is how police treated him in his own community. What kind of emotions were going through your mind when you're sitting in that police car? Painful, because we're an advocate for the cops. We do Faith in Blue, we do jazz concerts, we just play basketball with them a day before in the community. The first thing is we need to deal with the culture of policing in the blackest city in America, that's number one. Number two, we need to be willing to say, listen, we need to build bridges of trust with our community instead of suspecting the worst out of our community. And then number three, we need to continue to serve. Let the past be the past and continue to serve our community in 48227. We reached out to Detroit police but did not hear back by our deadline. On Detroit's west side, Brandon Hudson, Fox 2 News. You might think policing is only about investigations and enforcing the law, but it's actually so much more. Yeah, Farmington Hills police proved that recently, helping to... I should have told you all this, but I was afraid. I was afraid to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you today. And some of you are going to be offended. And some of you actually are going to be called out. The Holy Spirit is going to convict you. And some of you are going to need to repent. Some of you may get up and leave. But the truth is coming today. Because the truth will do what? The truth will set you free. I want to show the video when I first became the pastor of this church. I want to show the video, Hugh, if you can get that ready. Somebody say, we're in a war. Uh-huh. I want to show the video when I, the, when I was announced as the pastor of this church. Present Pastor Lorenzo and uh, his awesome wife, Molly, to you guys in a formal way. Uh, this moment has been not only a year in the making, but really it's been from the beginning of all time. Because how many know we serve a God who is sovereign and does all things well? He is constantly and consistently superintending the affairs of our lives. If you ever question that, just revisit scripture. And you'll discover that even when you cannot trace his hand, you can always trust his heart. And today, I am so excited about that. Um, as uh, Pastor Lorenzo and Molly come at this time to join us on stage, I also, come on, give them a big, big hand. Oh, you could do better than that. Come on. How many were here on that day when, when that happened? Okay. All right. So that was the day I was announced as a senior pastor of this church. Let me tell you how that worked. Okay. Um, God called me to my city, Detroit. He called me the pastor evangel. He confirmed it. Through a search committee, many of some members of that search committee are present with us right now. Elders, they also voted unanimously. Somebody say unanimously that I was the pastor of the church. That's how I became the pastor of the church, okay? 
There was a letter that was written by the founding pastor's son that I should have told you all about. The way that this letter came, it came from me coming into the office in a day that I normally don't come into the office. I came into the office on the Monday. I walked into the office, in de into the office, in Deacon Van, he handed me this letter. Let me read to you what this letter says. Somebody say, we in a war. We're in a war. Let's, let me read. Dear Evangel Congregation, I am writing this letter to the entire church. Words alone cannot describe the bond that I feel to this ministry. And I was at the first service Evangel held over after acquiring the building back in the early 70s. I attended the church there regularly until moving from the state of Michigan in the early 90s. Obviously, the Bogle ties are strong. Perhaps I don't meet up with the requirements of being a bona fide member, but my love for the spiritual connection to Evangel is as deep as anyone's. The matter at hand is a clear decision for me. Evangel Church should not cease to exist as an independent ministry, nor close its doors. It should be clear that this path, that this is the path the church is on. In fact, the process is nearly 80% complete. I, bes I beseech Pastor Sewell to change course. You were selected to lead the flock, not to dissolve the assets and essence of the church. Pastor, if you truly see the situation as unwinnable, please step aside and allow the congregation to choose a pastor that does. I beseech the church elders to reevaluate the entire situation and realize your mandate to ensure the success and continuance of this ministry. This alone should be your focus. Evangel Church is a ministry with a divinely inspired heritage and one which was truly birthed by the Spirit of Christ. I exhort you to, to rise to that same calling and to provide the congregation with the leadership they deserve. I beseech the congregation to realize that Evangel is both Christ's and your church, and he has entrusted its care to you. The ultimate responsibility for Evangel's future is in the hands of God and the congregation. Accept the responsibility with all the prayerfulness and seriousness it requires. Evangel's future depends on it. Know that the Bogles have been praying and seeking God on the, on the matter since we first heard the news. We believe firmly in our spirit that God's will for Evangel is not to close, but to continue and thrive. If there is anything we can do to support you, simply ask. We are committed to you. Thank you dearly for your opportunity to share my heart and thoughts with you. I love you in the Lord and continue to pray that God will guide and protect you. May God bless you indeed, George W. Bogle Jr. When that letter came to me, I should have came to you, and I want to ask you to forgive me for that. When that letter came to me, immediately I should have came to the congregation, and I did not. I need you to forgive me for that. I need you to forgive me. This letter was sent by the former pastor of this church to two leaders in this church and went throughout the congregation. If you have ever read that letter before, can you just wave your hand at me? If you even know what I'm talking about, okay. Okay, you've read, okay. Okay, you, you've read that letter. When that happened, I should have come to you, but I was afraid. I didn't know what to do. I'm a new pastor. This is the founding pastor's son that came from my predecessor. I had no idea what to do, and I'm sorry for that. I should have been stronger. I should have came to you, I should have been wiser. I should have said, you know what, let's talk about this. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do it because I was afraid. I'm asking you to forgive me for that. And I'm repenting and now I'm dealing with the truth. Somebody say the truth. The truth will set us what? Instead of doing what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, the Bible says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except by two or three witnesses. What does that mean? If an elder of a church is in unrepentant sin, that means, and I'm going to just keep it real, I'm going to get real raw right now, okay? That means if I'm sleeping around or if I'm stealing money, y'all, and somebody says, Pastor, stop doing that. And then I'm like, oh, I ain't doing that, I ain't doing that. And they say, no, 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 Pastor, we see you doing that. I got, I got to go get two or three witnesses, and then I refuse to repent. That's when you bring me before the church. That's what the Bible teaches. It's unrepented sin. But can I show you what happened on December 15th in this church, right here where I'm standing? Somebody say we're in a war. 
Come on, turn the lights off, my brother. I want to see the video December 15th, please. Can you show the video? Go ahead, you can cut it. How many were here on December 15th? I am so sorry that you had to see the deepest violation to God's heart. This is the bride of Christ. This is the church of God. And you had grown men in here grabbing each other, tussling right here at the altar. And I want to ask you to forgive me for taking so long to confront this. It's been three months. I've given people opportunity to repent but I've not brought it before you. And I want to say right now, I'm sorry. Forgive me. That day, there were threats passed out against this church to bring a lawsuit against us. A lawsuit that is frivolous. A lawsuit that has zero grounds. And what I'm saying to you as your pastor, the devil does not want us winning this community. The adversary is against this church to stop us from going out and seeking and saving the lost. The enemy is trying to do everything to distract us, to divide us. The enemy is trying to do everything in order for us to be discouraged. But how many know no weapon formed against us shall prosper? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. When this took place, I confronted my predecessor. I confronted him. I confronted him in the presence of Tim Bogle in the presence of Pastor Kenlock, in the presence also of Pastor Vaughn, in the presence of Phil Carr, and in the presence of Daryl Kimbrough, I confronted him and I told him to stop. I said, I believe you're a part of this. He said he wasn't. I still believe he was. And this is why. The letter that I read to you, it was sent from him to two leaders in this church and it got out to our congregation. And this is another sign and proof to show that he's involved. Hit the lights. Put on a picture. Somebody say we're in a war. Does anybody know who that is? Huh? Anybody know who the man is behind him? That's Greg Smith, Pastor Chris Brooks, and Tim Bolton together in a secret meeting. A meeting that I knew about that, but that I did not agree to. About this church. There's only one pastor in this church. I thank God for Pastor Bogle and I thank God for Pastor Brooks. But at the end of the day, they had their opportunity. And now it's our opportunity to impact this community. Hit the lights. Now, what are we doing as elders? This is what we're doing. Two elders from this church have confronted two elders from Woodside Bible Church. And they're denying Chris's involvement. And I just want to be real honest with you all. In order for us to fight for this community and fight for this church, we got to all fight together. And we need to say enough is enough. Listen, Pastor Bogle had his opportunity. We thank God for him. Pastor Brooks had his opportunity. We thank God for him. But now God has given us a new season. We have a new pastor. This is a new decade. And God is calling us into a different vision, all for his glory. We just want to see this community transformed. And we have to be willing as a church to say enough is enough. Now, microphone, does anybody have any questions? In a very short period of time, within, within 14 days, um, it was actually... I think 12 days or, or 11 days from the time that she signed the order. It was a 12 days since the time the order was signed until the next court date. And so within that period of time, the other side gets an opportunity to file their own pleadings, to file responses as to why this temporary restraining order shouldn't be in place. Because underlying the, 20, the, the temporary restraining order is a lawsuit. We have claims of fraud. We have claims of, uh, of, of breach of um, uh, breach of contracts. And we have all kinds of tort claims, meaning that harm has been, injury has been done. So we have those underlying it. But in the meantime, the status quo which should be maintained because without the status quo being maintained, there's irreparable harm that's going to happen 
to this church. And also, in order for a judge to continue a preliminary injunction, what she is indicating is that there's a great likelihood of success, a strong likelihood of success for uh, Pastor Sewell and uh, Evangel Church, that, that, that that's the reason why it continues. So it's continuing because of that. So the judge's options are she could dissolve the TRO and say, listen, I'm going to let uh, let the let the pastor stay out of the church and let this lawsuit continue, or I'm going to keep the TR the t- uh, temporary restraining order, and then it turns into and it morph, morphs into what's called a preliminary injunction, and that's what we have right now. That during the pendency of this case, this will be the status quo unless something, some great, great uh, something great changes within the case. Now the other side contends that you know there was a lawsuit uh, several, two three years ago which talked about how the church should be run. But that lawsuit didn't talk about who the pastor should be. And it didn't talk about any rightful election. And the judge completely shot that down. And that's why she said, look, from this particular issue, the pastor's going to win. I don't see any way around the pastor not winning this particular issue. And that's why I'm maintaining the status quo. That's why I want everything returned. And that's why if it's not returned in a short period of time, I will sanction those other sides, meaning that she'll penalize them financially for the most part. Got it. So, Pastor Sewell, you're, Sewell, you're, you're, you're in your church now, right? Yes. Yes. Uninterrupted. Nobody's coming in. Nobody's trying to stop you from going in. Nobody's coming in interrupting your service. Right. You just want your church's money back. Because we adopt four cities. We no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm not asking you to justify that money. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not, a, listen, I'm not asking you to explain why you need the money. No, 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 no. Please don't misunderstand that. I'm just saying the law is on your side. According to this Amen. judge, the law, the law is on your side. So it seems that the only thing you need to do is keep doing what you're doing and get your money back. Right? Amen. Yes. Counselor? They will be in court tomorrow. What time is it here? You know, what, what happens is you file a motion, mm-hmm. and you file that motion and ask the court to continue the show cause or continue and uh, to in, enforce its order because it's clearly a violation of the order at this point. And it's, it, it appears to be a willful violation of this order because even though their lawyers were on, those individuals were at the hearing and they heard what the judge said. So there's a clear intention to violate that order. And, you know, what I suspect is they've dissipated those funds. They've, they spent those funds. I know they and, did. You know, I, you know, so, I'm you know, sure they, they did, but you know something? There's a whole lot of stealing a person can do, but stealing some money from the church? Mm, mm, mm. Stealing some money from the church? Mercy. Better turn over some stuff and go get you some. They better do something, get the Lord's money back. I mean, seriously. I mean, how how brazen is that? I mean, don't they understand you might get in your car and go out there and become a statistic? It's crazy. Oh, yeah. The judge says the judge says is stolen money. The judge said she wanted that money back in the church's account. Enough said. Yeah. And and we're going well past 70 96 hours at this point. Oh lord. I tell you some of the but this could have been even worse. So, uh because I've seen some crazy church fights, the, the the arresting by the police and all of that. Well, what's interesting is the leader, the one who's leading these people, and, you know, it's almost like the blind leading the blind, but the one who's leading these people, he actually had a physical fight in the church. A fight in the church. And these, this is what they call their leader. Lord have mercy. But yeah, that judge- was on December 15th. December 15th. They came in 2019 and they had a physical altercation in God's house. Can you imagine that? I cannot. But what is what what I don't understand is it's been five years. You became pastor in 2018. You know, it used to be that 
when you didn't like who the new pastor was, you just moved on, found your church, and goodbye. This yeah, is- but when you have when you have white folks who have a mindset of privilege and exploitation of our people, this is just what the the enemy, Satan, wanted to do: is disrupt, steal, kill, and destroy. And he used a privileged group of people to exploit our people into thinking they can church jack us. You know, I've, I've, I know a lot of words, heard a lot of words. Pastor, you've given us another one this morning. <laughs> church jack. <laughs> well, listen, I'm hoping that, that, that the, the money is returned uh, to the church. And if this judge is as serious as she sounds and what she issued, the order she issued, somebody better go find 30 grand. They, I, I, don't, I don't know how many of them there are, but certainly if it's six, each one can come up with five, but that judge is not playing. Get repl- Return the money. Return the money. Well, we're going to keep watching this story. Thanks for so. Hopefully, that money is going to be returned. We'll keep. We'll stay in touch to see how this story ends. Thank All you right. so much. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, consi- no problem. Bye bye. Can y'all believe that? Thirty grand. I mean, they were so shrewd. <laughs> So y'all all bragging about technology. Technology has its downsides. I'm not against te- technology. Let me. I, I'm just being silly. But somebody can go in and do a little playing around with some keys, and they were able to get 30 grand out of the bank. That's scary. It's just really scary. But I still can't get over these people thinking that there would be no repercussions from taking money that was not theirs from the church. Okay.